Hey, Jason, this is uh, Patrick Anderson. Just wanted to say congrats on a thousand episodes and wanted to let you know how much I appreciate all the education you've uh, given. Uh, me personally, it's helped a lot. I just wanted to reach out and say uh, thank you for everything you've done and uh, appreciate all your help in uh, real estate investing. Have a great day. Welcome to the Creating Wealth Show with Jason Hartman. You're about to learn a new slant on investing, some exciting techniques, and fresh new approaches to the world's most historically proven asset class that will enable you to create more wealth and freedom than you ever thought possible. Jason is a genuine, self-made multimillionaire who's actually been there and done it. He's a successful investor, lender, developer, and entrepreneur who's owned properties in 11 states, had hundreds of of tenants and been involved in thousands of real estate transactions. This program will help you follow in Jason's footsteps on the road to your financial independence day. You really can do it. And now, here's your host, Jason Hartman, with the complete solution for real estate investors. Welcome to episode 1272, 1272. Thanks for joining me today as I am coming to you from Tampa, Florida. Came here on Thursday evening for the Beck concert and uh, took a friend of mine uh, who is a huge Beck fan. Not sure if you're familiar with the musician Beck. He's a super talented guy. He's won a couple of Grammy Awards. He was uh, so gracious and uh, gave us all access passes to the event. His manager escorted us around. We were on stage, on the stage. This is only the second time I've done this at a Beck concert. He, um, you know, uh, let us go back there and, and film from the stage as we're looking out onto 20,000 fans. It, it was quite exhilarating uh, to do that. Really, really fun. And he was playing in Tampa. So I sent him a text and said, hey, can you hook us up with some tickets? And he said, sure, no problem. And uh, that was really nice. So hats off to Beck, who is a podcast listener. If you hear this, uh, thank you very much for uh, just a, a great evening that you cannot get anywhere else. Uh, that, that was phenomenal and uh, a fantastic concert. I am now staying in Tampa to dodge the hurricane. Yes, uh, this is a Category 5 very scary hurricane. It's my first one. And I'll tell you something, um, kind of a crazy little thing about me. I love storms. I was talking to my mother about it yesterday, and she said, yeah, always as a kid, you love storms and, and weather phenomena, and I really want to go back home. I want to go back to the east coast of Florida and experience the hurricane, but Category 5 might not be one to mess around with, so uh, let's hope that uh, people have evacuated, prepared, and uh, they stay safe. Let's hope that this kind of stays off the coast and doesn't really hit the land too much. Um, uh, so, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. It's just too early to tell. But by tomorrow, we are going to see what happens. And, you know, it reminds me of another thing. I remember uh, a couple of months ago, I was talking to my girlfriend about this. And I was saying, you know, isn't it uh, amazing how, how grateful we should be that our lives matter. Everybody's life matters. And we were talking about it in the context of uh, uh, a TV show that used to be on, maybe you watched it, Cold Case, and how uh, I think there was a Cold Case uh, article I saw somewhere online and a murder mystery that was solved from 35 years earlier or something like that. And just be grateful for the incredible amount of infrastructure we all benefit from in society, whether it be our tremendous legal infrastructure, for example, in the cold case, and it might not be a criminal uh, issue, it might be civil law. I mean, the courts are here to settle disputes and to get deadbeats to pay us when they don't pay us and to rescue us from natural disasters. It is really, truly amazing how thought out the world is, how much our ancestors have done for us. You know, I remember reading that the reason uh, when when you're on a plane, the reason they turn off the lights for landing at night is so that your eyes can adjust in case there is an emergency and you need to exit that plane and you need to see outside. I know that might seem like a, a minor thing that you'll never need, but it just goes to show you that so much has been thought out for us. 
there is so much infrastructure out there for us. I read this morning that the uh, mass transit, the bus line in Florida has shut down its normal routes and it's doing evacuations. The shelters are opening. I mean, it is truly amazing the amount of infrastructure we all benefit from and we usually don't even think about it. We usually don't even give it a second thought. The fact that you know, you can turn on the tap and hot and cold running water come out uh, that uh, most of the time the internet works. It, it's, it's just an amazing time to be alive. And, and I'm not giving the government a ton of credit for this, although the government certainly provides some of this, right? But it could be done by the free market. Uh, and we could debate uh, libertarian politics here if, uh, if we wanted to, but, but that's not really the point. The point is, just being grateful that the infrastructure is there for all of us. And this is true no matter what country you live in. And it is really pretty amazing that it is all provided and uh, and the way current people have jobs, their whole careers are based around providing this infrastructure for us. And our ancestors have thought of so many problems and solved them for us before we even got here, before we were even born. So uh, so it is truly, truly amazing. And it is Labor Day, by the way, and uh, maybe we should call it anti-Labor Day, right? Because the whole point of becoming an income property investor is so that labor becomes our choice, not our requirement. And, you know, the first Labor Day, it was a result of a strike. And uh, it was it was celebrated on September 5th, 1882 in New York City. That was the first Labor Day. We're not sure who exactly uh, came up with the idea, I guess. But it's quite interesting. Whenever you think of Labor Day, think of that is why you're investing in, in income property, right? The most historically proven asset class in the world so that you can choose your labor. Now, I believe in labor. I don't believe in retirement. Uh, I don't believe in kicking back on a beach, although, you know, sometimes you need that, right, to recharge your batteries. But I do believe that meaningful work is an important component of life. And uh, I hope you believe the same, but you're entitled to view it whichever way you want. If you want to kick back on the beach the rest of your life and collect your rents from your properties, more power to you. It's just not my thing. But the idea that labor should be volitional, that we should get to decide what labor we want to do and not be forced to do labor that is uninteresting to us. And that's how we'll create the best value for humanity. If something is interesting to us, then we are going to bring more of ourselves to that labor, and it's going to be better labor. It's going to be uh, more valuable to other people, and that's what we're all here for. Today, we have a great interview coming up. A returning guest back on the show, Chris Porter with John Burns Real Estate Consulting. We had a very interesting conversation, and uh, without further ado, let's dive into that one, and you can uh, hear all about a variety of topics that we discuss. I think you'll really enjoy this. It's my pleasure to welcome Chris Porter back to the show. He's a returning guest, and he is Senior Vice President and Chief Demographer at John Burns Consulting. Of course, is co-author of Big Shifts Ahead, Demographic Clarity for Business. And we're going to talk about a variety of topics today. I can't wait to dive in. Chris, welcome back. How are you? Thanks so much, Jason. It's good to be here. Are you coming to us from uh, Irvine, California? Yes, so we're, we're based here in Orange County. My old hometown. Good stuff. We were talking off air a little bit, and maybe this would be a good start to just talk about the completely sort of primitive style in which we still build homes. And you made the, well, I don't think it was a joke. I want to say it was a joke that the, I'll, I'll let you tell the punchline. What's the biggest advancement in home construction, Chris? <laughs> This is one of our, our clients had mentioned this to me one time. He says, you know, it's the nail gun. I mean, you look at the last 50 years and and really we have not made a ton of advances in building technology. I mean, I think there's a lot. We're making homes more efficient and, yeah. and, and more energy efficient. I think there are some some advances being made, but really, I think there's a lot more that, that can be done still. There are. And of course, that's a joke. But it's also true at the same time, because from a broad look at things, certainly construction quality is much better. The efficiency of the supply chain with all the software and information technology is is dramatically better. No one would deny that. But, you know, it's still the same basic process. And I cannot believe 
we do not see more modular construction. Keep hearing about 3D printed homes. I don't think I think that's sort of a myth, but you know, you can correct me if I'm wrong. It's the same basic process, you know, the way we built houses 100 years ago. What's going on? You know, you're right. It is very similar to how we're doing it before. Again, we are more efficient. I think the supply chain, as you mentioned, is a lot better. But I think we are going to get to the point where, and especially as we're dealing with a labor shortage right now in the construction industry, I think this is a great time for technology to step in and help us rethink the way that we build homes in, in, in the future. So we have seen some, some of that technology, uh, the 3D printed home. You know, you see a lot of videos on that online. I don't think that's going to catch on with the mainstream right away. And it's still very expensive at this point. But who knows down the road? And I think there's, there's a lot of – I mean you look at other countries around the world that are doing this. I think it's only natural we move in that, that direction. And so on one side of it, you've got this stigma – from, I guess it's kind of an American stigma, and I think it needs to go away, it needs to change, where this old idea of a mobile home in a trailer park, a mobile home park now. I own a mobile home park, and that's a great investment, by the way. Um, yeah. uh, not not all of them, they can, they can like anything, they can be problematic. But, I mean, the stuff they can do nowadays that is modular is totally different than these old ideas from 30, 40, 50 years ago, right? You're exactly right. I mean, if they can build a, a panel in a factory and really control the precision, I mean, they, they have fantastic calibration on the precision of these, you know, where they're able to put nails in and, and actually reduce the amount of waste as well. Mm -hmm. you cut, think about how they're cutting lumber to fit exactly and reduce on-site waste. Um, I think there's a lot of advantages and the fact that you're not necessarily limited by daytime hours, for example, or by weather. Right. So if you can build the pieces in a factory and assemble them on site, uh, I think there are some real efficiencies that, that can be gained there. There are. And, and you know, this, this whole stigma needs to change. I, I think it's really got to change. And we've got to get more high tech about construction. And, and this could lead to some relief in the cost of housing. And it can only be good, right? We we just got to move past this idea that of sticks and bricks for houses. It, it's just old fashioned. It, it needs to mature. Now, we investigated this because it sounded way too good to be true. And it turns out it was, you know, oh, you you know, all the, the media loves to run with these articles. And it's just a half baked story of, oh, buy a $10,000 house on Amazon.com and have it delivered. And well, I called those vendors myself because I wanted to see what they'd say. And turns out by the time you're finished, it's $200 a square foot with engineering, construction, plus land cost. <laughs> so <Sure>. that, didn't, <laughs> that didn't turn out to be anything like it was advertised. And how big is the home? Well, they, you know, some of them look pretty cool. They're not very big, but, uh, you know, they have like the container style homes. They have the log cabin style homes. And they had one that looked really cool that was $40,000. And I thought, I'm just going to start buying up little lots of land. I'm going to play developer myself put a bunch of these on my, my lots and rent them out. It was nothing like it seemed. Uh, sure. th this is a myth. You've got to have the electrical, the plumbing, the HVAC, that you've got to hire engineers. You've got to get permitting. It's a whole big process. Right. It's almost like building a house. And we've seen a little bit with the, the sort of that tiny home movement that was going around for a little mm -hmm. while. Yeah. What we've heard is that you know, after a year or so, some of the novelty of that just kind of wears off. And they're ready for a little bit more space and a little bit more storage. So it was kind of a, a fad for a while. And I think we are looking, you know, there are certain segments the population want to sort of minimize. But in terms of a long growing trend, I think that tiny house movement is. It was a fad. Percent. Yeah, yes. it was a fad. <laughs> it's, it's funny. Speaking about this, though, the changes in building styles. I mean, tell us about some of those changes, because when you mentioned the tiny house thing, I think houses really could be smaller if they weren't designed so traditionally. Uh, you know, just a couple examples, right? I used to have a really nice 38 foot motor home and I loved it. It was amazing how much storage capacity was in that because instead of having a nightstand on either side of the bed, you know, you had built in cabinets and right. there was storage under the bed. The bed popped up and you could put stuff under there. We still have this idea of traditional furniture and traditional things. I also used to own a boat and that had a lot of storage. And then my girlfriend and I just went on a cruise about two months ago in the Baltic Sea. And our little cabin on the boat had loads of storage in it. It's funny how houses just aren't very efficient in, in that sense. They really seem like they could be smaller and you could still have as good a lifestyle if they were just more efficient. 
Yeah, and I think what we've seen is is function really matters to the buyers today. They like design and they like um, space, but function is something that they're really willing to pay for. Will this home work for my my family and I? So that's a big priority, I think, for for buyers today. Any good innovations you want to share with our audience on that front? Uh, you know, anything builders are doing? I mean, and I know it's not your maybe your beat or your department in the company, but you know, John Burns is always putting out uh, various things about changing styles and what buyers are wanting and, and such. You're right. It's not exactly my beat, but I can I can speak to a few things. I think one thing is the idea of the outdoor indoor space or indoor outdoor space. Mm-hmm. I think more people are living in a part of their life outside. And so they consider mm-hmm. their, their yard and their patio space as part of the indoors almost. And so they may not need as much space physically in the home, but if they've, if they've got that extra space outside that they can use for multifunction purposes. So if they're eating out there, they you know might set up a, a flat screen TV outside, just a place to really congregate and bring people together mm-hmm. that feels like part of the home as well. So that's, I think that's one thing we've seen for a while now, and it's still very, very popular with buyers today. Yeah, it's a good trend. I like it myself. Yeah. yeah. And you see a lot of companies on the building product side that are catering to this. You know, there's one company that I'm aware of that makes these huge sliding windows that really allow you to open up that space. And there's no problems with flow between the inside and, and the outside of the home. But then at the end of the day, you can still close that, that up and you've got the nice views, but you've got a little bit of that separation between indoor and outdoor for security and for, for weather as well. So it's, I think we, we see that as a continuing trend, the idea of bringing the outdoors in and the indoors out as well. Yeah, that's good. Good stuff. Okay, great. You know, if we've kind of covered this topic a bit, let's switch gears. You know, anything you want to share, demographics, that is your thing. Anything you want to share on demographics and how that's impacting the market or uh, or really anything else? We've got a bunch of stuff to cover. Sure. So I think one of the things we had talked about in the pre-call was just, uh, you know, where are some of the big shifts that we're seeing right now in, in housing? And I can relate some of this back to demographics as well. But, you know, I think we're kind of at a bit of an inflection point in the market right now. We're starting to see home sales. Uh, slow a bit, leveling off around 5.3 million across the country. And that's that's on the existing home side. You know, we're calling for a slight dip in home sales this year versus, versus last year. But, you know, I think the low mortgage rates in the, in the U.S. have just really helped fa- that from falling further um, as we look forward. You know, we haven't really seen mortgage rates this low since yeah. late 2016. We're talking about a 3.55% mortgage rate it's nationally. Amazing. Yeah, it really is amazing. <laughs> it is. You know, I think the other thing is we are continuing to see a shift to the the entry level buyer. You've seen a lot of builders pivot to really target that that consumer. Uh, it doesn't think- it doesn't feel that way, <laughs> but uh, you know, versus the market we had before the Great Recession, there was you know good amount of KB Homes, Dr. Horton, you know, entry level stuff out there, and it it doesn't feel like that yet. Now, Dr. Horton recently came out with a statement that they were committed to providing entry level housing, so. Mm-hmm. That's good, but yeah, I, you know, I think you've seen a lot of builders say, "Look, that we realize this is a, a growing target for us," and, and and pivot some of their strategies, opening up new brands that really do target a more entry level style home. Um, so I, I do think there's a lot of opportunity there. What we're seeing, though, and we can talk about this a little bit later as well, but from a demographics perspective, I mean, it is a little bit of a delayed buyer. Um, mm-hmm. So they have maybe they've invested in their education. They've gone to college. More of them have gone to college than in the past. Then they have the student debt on top of that that they've got to pay off. But once they are buying, you know, hopefully they've made a good investment in their education and it's paying off in terms of their their salaries and allowing them to, to buy homes. So I do think there is a, um, especially as we look at this group born in the 1980s and then the group that is now coming of age born in the 1990s, they are reaching those years where they are forming their households and, and, and buying homes. And I think we are going to see some pickup in the, the home buying segment, really just as a, as a matter of demographics. Even if it is delayed, their numbers are just still so big. Meaning there's so many millennials out there that need to buy, about 80 million, right? Is that what right. you're referring to? Okay. Right. They're moving out of their parents' house finally. They're definitely impacting the rental market, a lot of them renting, but ultimately they're going to move into the home ownership market is what you're saying, right? Down the road. And it's going to be a bit delayed from where they, you know, their parents or the grandparents were at the same age. But, you know, you look at survey after survey and we're still led to believe that 
everybody wants to, or not everybody, but right. the majority still want to own a home at some point in their lives. Yeah. It's just taking a little bit longer. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. Good. And what about the baby boomers uh, moving out and renting their new house? But then there's a lot of you know, there's a lot of talk about aging in place. I mean, there's some kind of a lot of conflicting stuff here, and I don't, I don't know what to make of it. Thoughts? You're right. It, it is kind of conflicting. I mean, we, I mean, I naively, before I got into the home building arena, used to think, well, once you retire, you just pack up and move to Arizona or move to Florida, and and that's it. But that's really, <laughs> that's really not the case. I mean, you do see this preference to to age in place, and I, I look at my own parents. You know, they live in Michigan. After a couple brutal winters, we thought for sure they were gonna to move to the south. But it's hard to leave your community that yeah. you've built up for the last 30, 35 years. And so I, th I think they'll eventually move. But for now, they're staying put and, and they're you know, they actually built a new house in, in Michigan. So I think a great majority of people do tend to, to age in place. So I think there's some real good positive upside for the remodeling market in that respect and that they're helping. They're going to need to improve their homes to make sure that they're livable in their, their older age. But one of the things we've also seen is – a growing preference for renting mm -hmm. amongst the older households. You know, part of that I think was driven by the, the great recession when the, the housing market crashed. We did see people out of financial necessity turn to renting as opposed to owning a home and maybe they got foreclosed upon. Right. But I think there's a, a preference shift as well. Mm -hmm. And it's not I agree. majority, but I, I do think that there's a greater percentage of, of older adults who are saying, you know what? I like the flexibility that renting yeah. gives me. Yep. It allows me to go on vacation and let somebody else worry about the maintenance of the, the yard or the home. Well, I'm gone. And I think especially as they're traveling to be near their kids or their grandkids, that is something that's important to them is having that flexibility. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. That's um, see that stigma, the stigma of being a renter versus being a homeowner that seems to have dissipated. It hasn't quite happened in the modular home discussion. <laughs> so right. I'm hoping we'll see it there, too, because some of these modular homes are fantastic. I mean, the product is really good. So, yeah. I also think the uh, the single family rental mm -hmm. market has opened up a huge opportunity for these older home or excuse me older households as well. Yeah, the big institutional investors like in vacation yeah. homes, sure, sure, absolutely. If you look at the rental housing market across the country, a third, fully a third of all renters in the US are renting a single family detached home. Mm -hmm. And that's been going on for decades. It's gotten a lot of press in the wake of this institutionalization of that space. Mm -hmm. But now that you've got these companies that are managing them and managing them in in mass quantities, I do think it provides a great opportunity for somebody to rent and they're not having to rent an apartment. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but if they, you know, they've accumulated things over their lifetime and they, yeah, they just can't see themselves the moving into a really small space and putting all their stuff in storage, they could rent a detached home, still have the space, but have the flexibility of being a renter as well. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. I agree. That's a neat trend. Now, do you think, Chris, that the institutional owners are in it for the long haul or are they are you seeing any like activity of uh, they think, hey, they've made some money the past several years. It's time to start unloading these assets and I don't know, buy something else with their, you know, do some private equity deals or whatever they're going to do. Right. I think, you know, it really has become a very established asset class. And I think that there is a long this this really does have some legs to it. I think mm -hmm. it's going to have a long future. I think the the challenge has been, you know, now that they've swooped up a lot of the distressed properties out there, it's finding the next batch of, of homes to buy up. So we've actually seen an emergence of the, the build for rent uh, mm -hmm. concept where these companies are looking at how do we build an entire community, mm -hmm. you know, rather than having random homes scattered throughout a, a metro area right. that they, they've bought up individual homes. How do we actually build a, a community that's designed to be a rental, mm -hmm. but it's detached homes and manage that? I mean, there's some great efficiencies there by being able to do it all in one neighborhood or one community. Sure. Absolutely. I call that a, uh, and maybe you call it the same, the horizontal apartment complex. In other words, it, it doesn't go up like a lot of them do. It just goes horizontal, right? Yeah. Right. Well, there, so I would make a little bit of a distinction there. So there are some horizontal apartments that really just do feel like um, apartment buildings. But yeah, there are, I agree. Yeah. We've so, also seen some really nice, nicely well done detached homes that, you know, really look no different from the home you might see on your, your street but really built with the, the renter in mind. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so it also affects the, the types of products they put in the home. You know, they want something that's going to be durable. That space continues to evolve. And I think we're going to see more and more of builders looking at how do we incorporate rental 
homes into our communities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a really interesting trend, and that is a huge shift. We have never seen that before in our history. That's a real change post-Great Recession uh, that yeah. looks like it's going to be with us for a while. You guys coined the term Serban, a mix of urban and suburban. What is Serban? Really, it's the idea of, of bringing those urban conveniences to traditionally suburban environments. I think it's something that you know, the suburbs have seen the investments that big cities have made in their downtowns and, and seeing the benefits that those big cities have, have reaped from those investments. And the suburbs say we want some of that as well. And so it's really a, a planned strategic move on the part of the suburbs to develop their, their downtowns, create many downtowns where maybe they didn't exist before. It's got a mixture of retail, of restaurants, of you know maybe some office and, and some residential as well. The idea that you could live, work, and play all in the same area you might not need a, a car in the, during the week, but you might want a car on the weekends if you want to get out of town, for example. But the idea is really bringing that, those urban conveniences to these suburban areas. I think it's been something that's been in, highly in demand by the groups born in the 80s and the 90s, the, the millennials, as they you know, lived, tend to live in the cities when they were in their 20s. And now they're moving out to the suburbs as they start to have families and you know, move out for affordability or move for better schools. They're demanding some of those same urban conveniences. And so I think that the combination of the suburbs investing in their downtowns and these uh, millennials moving into the suburbs is really helping this idea to uh, gain further traction. I'm going to feign a little bit of naivete here. What are those amenities? So you've got really it's, it's kind of walkability. It's, it's having yeah. a, like a downtown Main Street atmosphere. You know, we, we know that people tend to move out of the cities for school quality, for example. So in mm -hmm. the suburbs, you have better schools than you might have in an urban area. Um, you've got lower crime in the suburbs than you do in, in the urban areas, for example. And so that's part of it. There's also just the idea of having that walkability of, of retail and restaurants, um, somewhere where you could you know, park the car and you could still walk around for a couple hours and, and eat dinner, go shopping. Mm -hmm. And you know, for some people that might be the same place where they, they work as well. You know, it might be a walk to the restaurants from their, their office and then another walk back to their apartment or condominium. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good stuff. Chris, we've uh, maybe addressed this already, but just any other shifts you're seeing now in, um, you know, housing styles, uh, what people want? Uh, just I wanted to just ask you one more time, is there anything else we didn't discuss on that side? Oh, I mean, there's a lot that I could I could <laughs> speak yeah. to on that. I think at the moment, nothing's nothing's jumping out right at me. I think mm -hmm. that indoor outdoor space is a big, a big deal for for people yeah. and in function. How do I make the, the homework for me? Make it more functional. Yeah, good stuff. Anything else you want to share uh, before we wrap it up? Sure. I, you know, one of the things we had talked about uh, a little bit was the delays in home ownership. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe I, I just address that a little bit. It is a demographic issue. I don't know. Maybe it's not that controversial, but I, I think it is because I, I studied this for a while. You know, the census has been reporting home ownership going up nationally for the last couple of years. And it's, it's dropped a little bit in the last couple of quarters. But you know, we're fully a point or two above where we, we were back in 2016. You know, we made the call about three and a half years ago and somewhat controversial at the time that homeownership was going to continue to go down in the U.S., really demographically driven, just as we saw these big waves of young adults coming of age and renting. And then on the other end of the age spectrum, a large number of people aging into those years where they're either passing away or they're going into assisted living and they're 80% homeowners and, and everybody in between was less likely to own a home than their parents or grandparents at the same age. So we made the call. We thought homeownership was going to continue to fall. We think that maybe the homeownership rate hasn't fallen that much as we were forecasting because we've had lower than expected mortgage rates. And we also think that lending practices have been a bit looser than maybe what we would have le been led to believe by the guidelines Dodd-Frank established. Yeah, it doesn't feel that way anecdotally. It sure seems like getting a loan is pretty tough nowadays, but... Yeah, I yeah. mean, there, there's definitely some areas where I think it is, you know, you still have to have good documentation and you have to have good credit scores. But I also think we're seeing higher loan-to-value ratios than maybe we thought we would mm -hmm. and, and debt-to-income ratios. And then, you you know, you see all these stories in the in the newspaper about alternative loans popping up here and there starting right. to emerge. And so, you know, I think uh, it's not as tight as we thought maybe it would have been, but yes, yeah, still much tighter than it was. Was before. Yeah. Back in the mid 2000s. No question about that. As, as I look at the, uh, the census numbers, you know, if we were seeing the kinds of growth and the absolute number of homeowners that the census numbers are saying, 
you know, I think we'd be seeing higher existing home sales. And I think our builder clients would be jumping for joy. Mm -hmm. And I think the census is also reporting some declines in overall declines in the, in the overall number of renters in the country. And we're just not hearing that from our, our either our apartment clients or our single family rental clients. So it's a bit of a conundrum for me. I'm trying to figure out some, make some sense of the, the census numbers. But I do think we are heading towards more of a, a rentership society. We're never going to get to the point, I don't think, where it's 50-50. But I don't see home ownership shooting back up to 68%, 69% anytime soon. And you know what, Chris? I think that's fine. I I, there's fine nothing too. wrong with that. I think that's healthy. And you know what changed my opinion on this? And I, I've been saying this for years. I can't remember when the article came out, but you, I'm sure you're familiar with it. It was on the cover of, I think, Newsweek or maybe Time. And it talked about how home ownership, the whole issue was like dedicated to this, how home ownership was not the panacea we thought it was and how actually when the home ownership rates are high in certain cities or neighborhoods it stifles growth and for 10 years i've been saying the best thing you can have on a resume is mobility to be able to move to where the jobs are and i've also been saying that i think the ideal home ownership rate and i'm admittedly this is not very data driven it's just my impression is about 55% that's what it should be, I think. And, you know, you, to hear anybody in real estate say that and they think it's blasphemy. But, like, why does everyone need to own a house? It's a, this is a crazy George Bush idea. It, does, <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. It makes people immobile. You know, if, if you can move to where better opportunities are to another city or across town, that's a good thing. I, I would agree. Yeah. Yeah, and I think you know the fact that we did have such high homeownership rates. I mean, people, homeowners are, are less likely to move than renters. We know it, that it's for sure. stifling. It's stifling. And so, things. when you look at the overall mobility in in the country, I mean, it's been going down for decades. And partially, that, that's partially driven by the fact that we're really pushing homeownership, and we just know that people are less likely to move once they they own a home. So, mm -hmm. it shouldn't come as any surprise to us that overall mobility is slowing. Because we've had just such high homeownership rates. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great point. I'm glad we agree on that. One last thing before you go, Chris. When John Burns uh, spoke at our event a year and a half ago at one of our conferences, he talked about how in the book that uh, you co-wrote with him, about how you don't look at the demographic cohorts the same way most demographers do. You know, they'll say millennials, Gen X, I'm a Gen Xer, baby boomers, etc. And then, you know, Gen Z coming up, right? You take it in the decade by decade, which I think is a much more precise way to look at it. And John, when he was on stage, gave the example of, I think, his daughter and Mark Zuckerberg. And they're both millennials, but they're completely different you know, people, right? Exactly. And, and, and do you just want to speak to that a little bit? Because everybody's throwing around millennials, baby boomers. It's really not precise enough, is it? It's not. So for that very reason, I, I, the example I always use is my dad, who was born at the beginning of the baby boom, and, and George Clooney, who was born at the end of the baby boom. And they've, they've had very different lives based on the events that occurred, you know, from their early childhood to their adulthood today. My dad's retired. Mm -hmm. George Clooney is still out there working and, you know, making movies and, and TV shows and, and all that. So you're right. I mean, I just uh, – we'll take the boomers, for example. 1946 to 1964, that's pretty widely agreed upon. But that's 19 years of, of people, and you just can't <laughs> make a comparison. It's not a meaningful conversation yeah. when you talk about boomers as one big collective group. So we did break down the, the generations into nice 10-year increments, really based on the decade you're born in. It makes the analysis really easy for us because I can divide by 10 or multiply by 10. Right. But a lot, really what it does is it allows us to see which are the groups that really shifted the needle. Either they accelerated some of the trends or they reversed some of the trends as well. For example, we could look at the group born in the 1960s. We call them the equalers. Mm -hmm. That was the first generation for which more women graduated from college than men. Mm -hmm. Now, we can say, you know, that was the group born in the 1960s. It doesn't have quite the same impact if you say, well, it was the late boomers and the early Gen X, you know, mm -hmm. that really made the shift. I think we can pinpoint and say it was it was the group born in the 60s for yeah, which right. that shift occurred. It's, it's much easier to quantify who those people are because, hey, you know if you were born in the 60s or not. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Everybody knows what year they're born right. in. Yeah. And it's just – it's nice, easy to manage definitions. And, and I, I always give this example of how do you define a millennial? And I've got articles from the press that show you know the earliest millennials starting in 1975 and the latest of them being born in 2010 – excuse me, 2000, uh -huh. it's too hard to, to manage a group of that size and nobody can agree on 
on the definition of the, the group. So we said, let's just make it easy and, and based on the decade people were born in. Yeah, that's a, that's a, a much better thing, much be- much better way to go. I, I wish it was more widely adopted, but hopefully you guys will <laughs> change the way people look at this. Uh, that's, we that's, hope, that's and maybe this, maybe this podcast will inspire somebody to, to think that way too. So. Hopefully there are a lot of other demographers listening <laughs> who will start speaking <laughs> in this way. Chris, give out your website. Sure, it's realestateconsulting.com. We also have a, a website, bigshiftsahead.com is the website for the book. For the book. And the book is great, by the way. Uh, oh, thank you. We, we gave them out at our event, and I've, I've still got a little a few left here. I give them out uh, once in a while to, to whoever, again, left over from the event. So, Chris Porter, thanks again for joining us. It's always good to have you on the show. Thanks, Jason. Thank you so much for listening. Please be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes. Be sure to check out the show's specific website and our general website, hartmanmedia.com, for appropriate disclaimers and terms of service. Remember that guest opinions are their own. And if you require specific legal or tax advice or advice in any other specialized area, please consult an appropriate professional. And we also very much appreciate you reviewing the show. Please go to iTunes or Stitcher Radio or whatever platform you're using and write a review for the show. We would very much appreciate that. And be sure to make it official and subscribe so you do not miss any episodes. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode. 